Inside the Mind of Sport, where we use the science of sport psychology and mental training to take you behind the latest news stories and inside the heads of the athletes that feature in them. In this very first episode, let's start with a story from the world of athletics. Last week, it became clear that Christian Coleman, the current world champion in the 100 meter sprint, received a two year suspension for having three doping violations in the last 12 months. These violations do not mean that he used performance enhancing drugs, but they are simply infractions on the doping regulations. In Coleman's case, he failed to show up to two visits with doping collecting officers, as well as he failed to change some information on his whereabouts. So if you are not aware of what whereabouts are, they're simply forms that state the location you're going to be in at a certain time. These are very important because it allows doping um, collection officers to find you and do unannounced doping tests. Now, there's a lot that is being said about whereabouts in different sports for a long time, and often they are explained as being extremely annoying and very taxing on the athletes. When this story broke, uh, in an opinion piece for CBC Sports, Morgan Campbell said, So if the time drain and tedium of constantly updating his location, just to facilitate unannounced drug tests, simply overwhelmed Coleman, I get it. I empathize. I've been there. The world's fastest human is still human. I think this captures the sentiment a lot of people have about doping and doping control uh, officers in particularly very well. There's this idea that they are mean people and they're out there to just get the athletes and make their lives as miserable as possible. But the problem here is that that's a sentiment that comes from the spectator perspective. And in order to understand what that spectator perspective is, we need to take one step back and look at a concept that is called the truth default. The truth default is a really interesting concept, and it basically says that unless there is overwhelming evidence that uh, something isn't true, humans will always assume that something is true. So if I go up to a stranger and I tell them a lie, Unless there's overwhelming evidence that I am clearly lying, they will just believe what I say. Applying this truth default to sports fans can lead to a situation in which fans will believe that an athlete is clean until they are proven to have used performance enhancing drugs. And if you assume that everyone is clean, if you use the truth default unless you get caught red-handed, then that can lead to this scenario in which the unannounced doping tests, the whereabouts, and all these hoops the athletes have to jump through in order to make it that the sport can be clean seem very annoying. And also, if you believe that an athlete is clean, it seems unnecessary. Why would you need to test them at that moment? What does it matter that you didn't know where he was? He's clean. The truth default means that from a fan perspective, we will see these kind of steps as being annoying. But now think about it from the athlete's perspective. More specifically, the ones that do not use performance enhancing drugs. From their perspective, you would be happy to be tested. Because if you're tested, that means that others are being tested. And if you feel like there's no way you could cheat the system, that probably means that nobody else is cheating the system. Many athletes are actually happy to be tested, and rightly so. If you are an athlete and your livelihood depends on how well you do in your sport, you would want everyone to be tested as often as possible to make sure that the sport is clean. Doping testing is not for the spectators. Spectators will enjoy watching the sport and probably even get a good scandal story from it later 
if it turns out that an athlete was doping. I know that I enjoyed watching Icarus, the documentary about the Russian doping scandal at the Winter Olympics in 2016 a lot. Doping testing is for the athletes because their careers and their livelihoods are on the line. It's important for them that they're competing on a fair and equal ground. Because if they get cheated by another athlete, they lose their livelihood, they lose their careers. So if you are clean, you would be happy to get tested, whether it's a nuisance or not. Next time you hear a story about doping, especially about things like whereabouts, try to keep that in mind. If you are a clean athlete, you would want everyone to get tested. The second story of this episode comes from the Ontario Hockey League, the OHL. On Friday, the Ontario Health Minister announced that in order for the league to be able to go ahead this year, no physical contact would be allowed at all, aiming to slow the spread of COVID-19 during games. This means no body checking, a key part of the sport of hockey. And although Ontario Premier Doug Ford released a statement the next day saying that he's working with the OHL to come up with a protocol that would allow body checking, it is still an interesting question to tackle. What would it mean for the athletes and coaches if physical contact wasn't allowed during games? To answer that question, we can look at the world of esports. Because those athletes actually face this exact problem all the time, and they're called patches. In essence, a patch is a change of the game. So, for instance, if we talk about games where you have different characters, some characters might get stronger, some characters might get weaker. There's constant changes in the game through these patches. For instance, in the most popular esport game, League of Legends, they're currently on patch 10.22, which means that just this version of the game has already been changed 22 times. If we translate that back to hockey, you could think about uh, changes such as different um, period lengths, maybe a different amount of substitutions, maybe the puck gets bigger or smaller, maybe your stick changes. Imagine the outrage if somebody suddenly decided that from now on you're allowed to have seven players on the ice. But in esports, dealing with patches is actually a key part of being successful and having a long career as an esport athlete. Generally speaking, there are two ways these athletes deal with the patches. One is defensively and the other one is constructively. When an athlete responds defensively to a rule change or a patch, he or she will blame external factors for the decline in performance or for the extra stress that it causes. Oh, this new patch has made me terrible at the game. The game is unplayable. We'll have to wait to the next patch before we can actually be good again. Obviously, this is not a very effective way to deal with patches. So when mental performance trainers work with esport athletes, they try to change it to a constructive way of dealing with patches. A constructive way consists of first understanding what the patch means and then trying to figure out what the best new way is to play the game. And being able to do this, figuring out what in esports the new meta or the new best way to play the game is, can be really important and can mean that you can be successful in different patches. This rule change in hockey would actually be a really interesting race between all of the teams to see who can adapt their mindset and tactics the most effectively in a short amount of time to facilitate these new rules. Think about it. Is a team going to react defensively saying, oh, it's not hockey anymore, we can't play? Or is the team going to say, okay, this is a new rule and how can we be as effective as possible with these new rules? But lastly, the same will also be asked from the spectators. 
a lot of public opinion seems to say, without body checking, it isn't hockey anymore, and I won't watch. And that's a very defensive way of dealing with this situation. So, if you are a spectator, and you would like to enjoy watching hockey, even if there's no physical contact, I would ask you, how can you adapt the way you watch to have the most fun while watching? You can pick whether you want to approach this from a defensive or a constructive way. That was all for this first episode of Inside the Mind of Sport. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment, and a review. And let me know if there's any particular news story that you would like to dive into and see what goes on inside the mind of the athletes that feature in it. Till then, hope to see you again at the next episode of Inside the Minds of Sport. <laughs>